a good morning. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this time again to open your word. We know, Lord, that there is much light that we have not fully seen. We know we have not always followed the light that you have given us. And that the darkness we are in is because of our sins. But we know, Lord, that you have come to redeem us. And that if we follow the light that you have given, then we can come out of this darkness. And so we ask that you can give us strength, discernment, understanding. And that you can correct errors that we may have in our personal lives. That you can correct our sins. That we can cooperate with you. And we pray for each person searching for truth. Help us, Lord, to represent you. As we open your word, as we look at the book of Judges, and we see how these things apply to the present time. We just ask that your Holy Spirit can correct us and also, Lord, that you can help us um, in ministering to those around us and those in this movement. We pray for the camp meeting, for the plans, uh, that you oversee them and that they will be according to thy will. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. And... Uh, we started yesterday, we looked at uh, this, the story of Abimelech, and we, we, we looked at the fact that in chapter eight, that uh, the issue here has to do with the methods of Bible study, particularly as it relates to time setting. Um, we know that the message of, of Gideon related to July 18, and now we have uh, the sons of Gideon, uh, 70 of them are legitimate and one illegitimate. And this illegitimate son uh, has this conspiracy uh, and he becomes king. So he's going to basically uh, convince people to make him king. But, and to do so, he's going to have to kill the 70 sons of Gideon, or as they sometimes say, the sons of Jeroboam. And there's three score and 10 of them. Now, one of the sons is going to escape, though they always say that the three scores and 10 are killed, right? So we know, obviously, there's an acceptation there. Now, one of the things about that, um, and this is just something that's come to mind, uh, that that is a difference in Hebrew thinking than in Western thinking. Um, so when someone says all, what do we mean in English in the West? If we say all of, the, all of them are killed, what would that imply? We would say all of them are killed. That would be no exceptions, right? So you'll see this all used in, in both the Old and New Testaments in a way that is, is not all, right? And we do that sometimes in English, that, that, and an example in the New Testament would be Hebrews chapter 11. It says these all died in faith, but it's going to mention Enoch. Did Enoch die? Well, we would say no. So, um, and, and none of them received the promise. Now, of course, Enoch did. And, and maybe some of the others were also resurrected at Christ's resurrection in all of these examples of faith. So, so this idea here that, you know, he, they killed the 70, and they're always going to mention the 70, even though only 69 were killed, uh, is just the Hebrew mind uh, expressing something. 
but also it, it expresses something more because God wills that all shall be saved, right? Are all going, going to be saved? Are we universalists as Seventh-day Adventists, that everybody in the end gets saved? No. No, right? Um, but some people take a verse like, you know, God wills that all men shall be saved. And, and there's other things, you know, all Israel shall be saved and, and different sort of statements like that in the scripture. I, I can't think of all the different verses right now offhand. Um, but people take things like that and they, they force upon the scripture something that's really unnatural. That is, they take a verse and say, this verse says that, so it must be true. And, and men can't go against God's will because God's all powerful. So if God wills that all men shall be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, then, then all men are going to be saved and come. But of course, there's other scriptures that show that that's not the case. But Sometimes people have a hard time reconciling that, even with the word forever, you know, um, because in English, we would tend to use the word forever, at least we would think of it in its literal sense, that it's unending. But in Hebrew, it doesn't have that sense. It is, things are conditional. Uh, but we do that in English too. So, um, you know, we have to be careful when we're looking at the scriptures that we take all of the scriptures and put them all together and not just take something out of context. Uh, and some people are very concrete and very literalistic in how they understand the world around them. Um, so it, it can be hard for them. Um, you know, an example would be, uh, you know, I'm going to use Tanya as an example when she would read Ellen White's statements that are obviously rounded off. And she would try to say they must be exactly 500 years because Ellen White says 500 years. And, and you know, it, so that would just be a concrete mind having a hard time dealing with those, those sort of, uh, really it's an idiomatic expression to round something up or down. And so Ellen White sometimes rounds things up and sometimes down. So, you know, we just need to accept that. But to base something upon, uh, like there is a statement that Ellen White makes regarding 50 years earlier. Um, um, I can't, I believe it's when Isaac is offered up. And um, so that has to do when he left Ur of the Chaldees. And so it's going to give you five years before he leaves Haran. And uh, uh, so Tanya says, well, you know, it, it is five years because Ellen White says 50. But 50 could be a round number. The Bible doesn't give us exactly how long it is. So we don't know whether Ellen White's being exact when she says 50. Now, if she said 51, we would know she was being pretty exact. So all I'm trying to say here is that when we study the scriptures, people will find these things as contradictions. So some people will say, well, there were 70 sons and Jotham obviously isn't one of those 70 because 70 were killed, right? So they say there must have been 71, but the Bible also tells us there were 70, right? And then some will say, well, that's just rounded off. And you have all these little problems that people have in trying to sort through these things. So, Dwight, did you have a comment? No, excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. <clears throat> now, so we're just going to read through this quickly because we've studied this before, and we're just going to remind us of, of what we understood before, and then we're going to try to place these verses where we would place them on the line. So we already read yesterday about Abimelech. So he's going to have this... Uh, conspiracy, he's going to go to his mother's brethren, that is the house of his mother's father, that's the family of the house of his mother's father, 
and he's going to say, do you want to have the 70 sons of Jeroboam reigning over you, or would you rather have your own flesh, your bone in your flesh? Because I want to be king. Basically, make me king. I'm a son of Gideon. Now, he's illegitimate, but that's not really the point. He says, I'm your brethren, which the other sons of Gideon are not. So they tell the men of, of Shechem, they get this uh, <clears throat> 70 pieces of silver, and they get it out of the house, house of Baal Bareth, right? So this is the Lord of the covenant, right? Baal being Lord, that's the God Baal, and Bareth is the Hebrew word for covenant. So he's going to hire vain and light persons which followed him. So these are his followers. He's going to give them this money. And they went onto his father's house, that is Gideon's house, at Oprah, and slew his brethren, the sons of Jeroboam, being three score and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding yet, Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. So, so technically, they're going to slay 69. And I think we're all agreed on that. Right, that there isn't 71 here. The only seven, if there is 71, the, the one is this illegitimate son. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Abimelech, right? So, so we're saying that, that Jotham represents the 70th week because the 70 sons represent these 70 weeks. Now, what's the basis for doing that? How can we just make this connection that these 70 sons are 70 weeks? Because people may not understand that step. How do we just come to this conclusion? I think it'd be worth explaining that step. Okay. So the symbol for July 18 is, of course, 187, but we also have 18720. So that number we connect to Lamech, right? And we have two Lamechs. We have one that is uh, the father of Noah, right? He lived 777 years. So we have that symbol of 777 connected with him. But also, if we take the gematria of his name and we multiply the letters, we get 18720. Right? This was discovered in November of uh, 2019. That this, at least this is when I first heard of it, just when I was traveling to Arkansas for November 9th. So... Um, <clears throat> And, and then we have, of course, the other Lamech, which the 70 times 7 curse would apply to anybody who would uh, seek revenge for the manslaughter that he uh, was involved in. Right? So he didn't do murder, he did manslaughter. That's why he says if Cain is somebody who kills Cain would be cursed seven times, then if somebody was seeking revenge because what I did was manslaughter, then there should be 70 times 7. Uh, curse put up on those who would seek revenge in, uh, by killing me, right? That's the way I understand it now. I didn't fully understand it that way at first, but we have the 70 times 7, so that's the 490 years, and we have the 777. Now, we know in the 490 years that there is these divisions. There's the 7 weeks, the 62 weeks, and the 1 week. So, if we multiply the first week that's seven times seven with the or the first seven weeks with the last week that's going to be uh seven times seven times seven that is if we multiply that last week and we get the number 343 and if we add that to the 62 weeks in the center 
which is 434 years, we get 777. So what we're saying is that this 70 sons are descendants of Gideon, and Gideon's message relates to the July 18, 2020 prediction. We've shown that, and Jeff applied it in that way. So this is then the descendants of that. That is, it's connected to this July 18, 2020. And so when we see the 70 and the one separated out, that would suggest the 70th week. Now, we had a study in 2018 on the week of Christ, that is the 70th week. And in that study, we had come to understand that the, there was the prophetic mirror, but that the years that went from right to left on the bottom lined up with the dates that went from left to right on the top. And so when I initially looked at this, we had this date, April 5th, 2030, that is the first day of the first month. Now, at first, when we seen, when I seen this, when I saw this, I wasn't, I wasn't predicting anything or, or I just noted that if we went to the first day of the first month in that week of Christ study, that we would come to this April 5th, 2030 date. But later I came to recognize that that date uh, was 2300 uh, lunar months from the first day of the first month in 1844, and that it was 187 years and 20 prophetic months, and also that it was 186 uh, biblical years. So there was these three primary calcu calculations, plus the week of Christ study that confirmed this April 5th, 2030 date. Now, there's more to it, obviously, than that. Um, all kinds of other uh, connections that it connected to um, Colin's study as well. So, so when we were studying this, initially, we already were understanding this April 5th, 2030 date. And so what we're saying is that this message is relating to that, that, that the message of Jotham is going to be about these messages um, that relate to the period of 777 days, but also that connect to this April 5th, 2030 date. So I, I didn't explain everything there. Uh, is there something that's not understood of, of how we did that? I mean, I know there's more to it, but I don't, I don't know if we, we need to go through more of it. In, when we did this study, uh, we went back over this uh, the second time. Um, uh, that study was, um, we were doing this in November. So if you go back to these studies, understanding the lines, and you go back uh, to November of 2022, we were addressing these lines, right? So um, trying to, just trying to figure out where exactly. Um, I think if you go back to studies like 218, uh, study number 218, around there, I think you'll find that we go through this study. Um, and up to about, maybe it's 228, 228 and a bit before. Um, 227, or 231. Okay, so November 27, we're going to be addressing that. That's where, we, where it is. Um, that's where we're going to address the parable of, of Jotham is on November 27th. So anyway, at that time, and even before, we were understanding April 5th, 2030. And anybody have a question regarding this? So Abimelech is going to kill these 70 sons. Jotham is going to escape. 
and then uh, they're going to um, it says all the men of Shechem gathered together and all the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. So we know where this is. And, and when we were studying this, uh, um, we, we studied this, of course, in the book of Joshua. So we studied the actual blessings and curses. So we know that in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 28 is going to be addressing this as well. So these are the blessings and the curses. This is going to happen at Shechem, this Ebal and Gerizim, right? These two mountains. And in, in this case, so Ebal, of course, is the Mount of Cursing and Gerizim is the Mount of Blessing. And so when they're making a, a Abimelech king in Judges 9, verse 6, uh, it says, they went and told Jotham, and he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, lifted up his voice, and he's going to give this parable. He says, hearken unto me, men of Shechem. So we know that this is, so we have the counterfeit covenant that is the Baal Bareth with these 70 coins. So there is a counterfeit here, right? Um, Abimelech is not, he's an illegitimate illegitimate son who's going to be made king and they're going to do this in Shechem and what's this pillar uh, that's talked about in 9 verse 6 why is it talked by the plane of the pillar that was in Shechem what are they talking about here isn't this talking about the pillar that was erected by Joshua? Yeah. So we have, so this goes all the way back to Joshua, right? So this is this same place. And remember, Joshua also renews the covenant there. And then we're going to have it here again. But this time it's going to be in rebellion, right? So they're going to make him king um, in this spot. So when Jotham goes on to the top of Mount Gerizim, what would be the significance of that symbolically? So we have Gerizim here, Mount Gerizim. What is this? What is this trying to tell us? Are we seeing a repeat of history here? Okay, so a repeat of history, but here in this case, uh, I mean, this is a counterfeit. Right. Right, so Abimelech is illegitimate. It's interesting, too, because if we look at this in another way, you have Abimelech, who is illegitimate, who was not even regarded as one of the legitimate sons of Gideon. He seeks to become king. <clears throat> He's not anointed, as were Saul, David, and Solomon. But no, he was no, we don't know. I mean, they might have anointed him when they made him king, but I don't know. It doesn't say that they did. Right. So from a scriptural point of view, he doesn't receive the Holy Spirit. It's not God's anointing, even if man did anoint him. Yeah. But instead of a three and one combination as we have addressed several times in the past you have a one and three 
that if we were to put one and three onto a board together, we would have 13. Okay, what, what, what are you talking about, the one and three? And the, what, what, where's, are you talking about the parable? I'm speaking, I'm speaking about Jotham seeking to be king because he stands I mean, as Abimelech, Abimelech seeking to be king. Abimelech, yes. Yeah. Now, Saul was presented to okay. the children of Israel by God. and was anointed by Samuel. David was presented to Samuel by God and was anointed. <laughs> Solomon became king at the great age of David and became king over the entire nation. Those three had a, were tied together because in these, in these situations, Samuel, as the representative of the prophets, anointed the first two. And then you've got Solomon, but we don't, as you were just pointing out, we don't see that right now with the Bimelech. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we have here, so um, so you're talking, well, I'll go back to first what you're talking about, then I'll go to us. Talk. So you're saying that we have the three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. This is outside of that. We have this first king that's an illegitimate king, and you're taking right. the one-three combination. So, you know, that's probably valid. Um, and uh, but, but we have some other things here that, so right. one of the things we have to look at, I mean, because that may be true here in that, that history. Now, if we look at Abimelech, this illegitimate son, now we could try to apply this to Parminder's message. Right, that there's this illegitimate son and he's going to be made king. Now we already dealt with, of course, Parminder's message back with Deborah and Barak. But I don't, I don't see that we have to even stretch to address Parminder's message as the illegitimate message. Yeah, but this isn't addressing. This is addressing Parminder's message after November 9th, oh, or is it? You know, I mean, one of the things we see with the lines is that it's not about Parminder in, in this context, right? So we're not we're not talking about Parminder as a person. We're talking about a message. And uh, this message has sought to be um, legitimized, right? It, it's it's a message that comes from the wrong method of study. It's dispensationalism, right? It's time setting. And so, so we know that that relates to it. Now, we, we're saying that Jotham's line, or Jotham, his line is going to go be this message that counteracts Parminder's message. Because Parminder's time setting. That's why we have this line here. We can say that Abimelech's downfall is the downfall of Parminder's message. Now, we know that there was this battle um, on all these things that happened from September 7th, really from August 29th, 2019 to November 9th, um, and, and that we have now this message of July 18. And we're saying that this 777 days is directly attacking Parminder's message. Right. So this is about Parminder's message in this line, but it's not about Parminder himself becoming king. Right. So we're not going to say Abimelech is Parminder. Right. We're just saying that the message of Parminder, what he was teaching. Is being addressed here because that message 
has still affected the movement. Agreed. And, and, and we seem to be unaware of it. That is, people think that because they rejected all of these liberal advances that Parminder had put upon the movement, that is, they don't accept pant wearing for women, uh, they don't accept all of this uh, liberal philosophy, this woke ideology, and you know they're not liberals, they're conservatives, so they say, well, we didn't follow Parminder, right? That, that's how we would look at it. And, and yet we still have the same spirit of Parminder because we still have the same ideas as Parminder, not the ones that we rejected, but the ones that are actually the basis for why he came to those conclusions. That is, we haven't really changed our thinking. We, we, there's a reason why Parminder's message affected the movement in the way that it did, because it appealed to aspects of human nature, but also it appealed to our reasoning, the way that we approach scripture. And that is, we approach scripture, the simple way that I would look at it, is we approach scripture, the study of scripture, to make ourselves feel better about ourselves by comparing ourselves with others. And that we're not reading scripture to bring conviction to our lives that will lead to repentance and conversion. That we're not studying the scriptures for that reason. That's the, that's the problem with Adventism. Adventism isn't interested in seeing themselves as sinners. They're only interested in justifying themselves. And we are no different. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We're Laodicean. We think we're rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Yet we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And we don't realize that the reason that we study the Bible is so that we can see that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Because until we see that, not that we see other people are, doesn't help us to see that the church is fallen, that it's in apostasy. It's not going to help us one whit if we ourselves don't, if we don't recognize that we ourselves are in apostasy. Because all we're going to do is justify ourselves. And so to me, that's the primary understanding of what's wrong with Parminder's method of study. It's self-exaltation and usurpation. It's the spirit of the papacy. So this message of Jotham, this, this parable, um, is, is symbolizing this period of time because this message comes at the time that Parminder is building his, his plans and executing them to seek to take over this movement. That is, he wants by November 9th, 2019, to have total control of the movement, right? I mean, that's why he has this date here and he's planning. And that's why they have the meetings there uh, in Germany. Um, uh, you know, just prior to November 9th. I mean, he's setting it all up, right? That by November 9th, his movement, he's got control. That's what he wants. He wants control of the School of the Prophets. He wants control of FFA. And Jeff's daughter, Bronwyn, is complicit with what's going on, right? She's wearing the pants, right? She's She's looking at that she's going to be in this position of power in this movement. And then Parminder pulls the rug out from under her. Now, I'm not really sure why Parminder did that. Um, you know, I don't know what his thinking is, was, whether he was uh, not wanting Bronwyn, because he, he definitely isn't uh, pandering to Bronwyn at this point. I think he must feel that he has control and power. Um, because he could have kept Bronwyn by pacifying her, 
right? But he didn't. Uh, you know, I, I don't understand uh, Parminder's thinking at all from trying to understand what his strategy is, whether that was intentional to alienate Bronwyn or not. Because it doesn't seem to work for him. He ends up not getting control of these institutions that he thought he would have control of. And, and it seems to me he needed Bronwyn to do that. But, you know, sometimes people buy into their own propaganda. Uh, they're puffed up in their own, uh, uh, their own thinking, and they, they believe that they can do things that they can't, you know, an egotistical mind, right? I don't know what, what you guys think about that, but, but be that as it may, you know, once we get to November 9th, and so he's starting this, you know, back in, in August, he's got all of these plans, they have this date, November 9th, um, but then Jeff, of course, steps in on September 7th, and even though Parminder tries to teach that De Jeff is dead, um, the reality is Jeff isn't dead, and uh, he's going to speak, right? And he's going to point out quite clearly that Parminder is in error, right? So when we get to November 9th, Parminder is, in a sense, defeated, right? His movement is defeated, except that his movement still continues. Abimelech's downfall is represented in this 777 days. That is, um, once we get to December 25th, 2021, not when we get to November 9th, right? We have to get to December 25th, 2021 to show this complete downfall of this message of Abimelech. That's how we have this line set up, right? And remember, this is this 2,391 days, which points us to uh, the door of the ark being closed October 22nd on the 10th day of the seventh month in 2391 BC, which is, of course, related to the 777. Uh, uh, chiasm, right, which relates us all to July 18th, relates us to Lamech. All of these things are tied together, right? <clears throat> I would agree. Okay. So, so now we have in Jotham's lines, the way that we laid this out is we said that this is seven years. This is the week of Christ study. Now, it's um, from December 21st, 2012 to November 15th, 2019, which is 25, 20 days. That, that's what we're marking here. And it's going to start with this failed prediction on the mind calendar. Um, but that's going to be connected to my first presentation on line upon line on October 5th, 2012, which is 77 days before December 21st. Now, so we have this here, we have to take these verses and see how we can apply them, what symbols are there. Now, when we get back to um, uh, Mount Gerizim, so we need to recognize what Mount Gerizim is in Shechem. We know this is the 2520, right? Blessings and curses. So why Mount Gerizim and not, not Mount Ebal? Why doesn't he stand, stand on the top of Mount Ebal and give this message? Why Gerizim? First, we'll see it's Judges 9 7. So, what's 9 7? September 7th, right? 2019. Now, the message is Jotham. So, this isn't talking about Jeff as a person. 
but it's talking about a message. And the message of Jotham is what message? We say it's the 70th week, right? It's this week of Christ's study. It's this prophetic mirror. It's the 2520. All of these things. But he's going to stand on the top of Mount Gerizim, not evil. Now, why Mount Gerizim? Why on the Mount of Blessing and not on the Mount of Cursing? Okay, so the Mount of Blessing represents the 2520 for Judah and the Mount of Cursing, cursing the 2520 for Israel. Uh, could we say that? Yes. Okay. Now we know, of course, they're all this, the curses. There's curses put upon them. But we know for northern Israel, the 2520 for northern Israel, they're scattered never to be gathered. That is, literal Israel is scattered. Uh, they're replaced by these people who later become the Samaritans. Right? We know with Judah, Judah is scattered, but they are gathered. They're going to literally be gathered. They're going to actually have, uh, after the city is, and temple are destroyed, they're going to be rebuilt, and they're going to be reestablished um, in this three-step uh, testing prophetic message, which is the three decrees. There's even a fourth, right? So they're going to be established. They're going to be gathered. And of course, literal Israel is scattered and gathered. And of course, they're going to be typify what's going to happen at the end of the 2300 days, which is the gathering of spiritual Israel. That you're going to have God's denominated people. Their probation closes in 34 AD after their seven, 490 year, 70 week uh, uh, probationary period. And then 36 years later, Jerusalem will be destroyed. And literal Israel, at that point, the, their, their blessings and curses pass on to spiritual Israel. But we're going to see in Millerite history from the time that there no longer is a denominated people. God's people, the Israelites, are no longer God's denominated people after 34 AD until we get to 1844. The God's denominated people are then raised up. And specifically in 1863, when they become a denomination. Right. And 1860, they get the name Seventh-day Adventist, but they become an organized church in 1863. And this parallels, of course, the beginning and end of the prophetic mirror with the Civil War and and what happens to uh, Israel at the beginning and what happens to spiritual Israel at the end. There's all of these different ties that we studied. So on Mount Gerizim, we have the 70th week, the message of the 70th week, which is. This message about April 5th, 2030, this message about the 2520 and prophetic mirror, the week of Christ study, um, all of these things that are connected to it. And it's going to stand upon Mount Gerizim. Now it's going to do so on September 7th, right? That is Jeff, when he gives that message against Parminder's movement, that's going to happen on September 7th. And that's going to be 239 days after October 13th, 2018. Right, so we have that, that um, Levitical chiasm, as Jeff called it, where you have the 126 days from June 9th, 2018 to October 13th. And that's going to be witnessed to by... Samuel Snow's letters. And then you're going to have 329 days 
pardon me, 239 days. Is that right? Did I get that right? I'm try just trying to remember if I got the number right. Uh, 200. Just hang on a second. Must be 239. Was it 329? I might have got that wrong yesterday. Is my sometimes I get a little bit dyslexic. Okay, so so I know the two three nine one, but I think it's three two nine one, three hundred and twenty nine days. Just hang on. So I might have got that wrong yesterday. I'm just going to check. Yeah, so I was wrong there. I got that number wrong. So this is not 2,391, 2, it's 3,291 3, days. Now, I'll just show you what I mean, what I changed here. So here is the chart. This was not 2,391, it's 3,291. Now they're still gonna relate to each other, um, but this is actually uh, from here, from this prophetic mirror, it's 3,291 days. So I got these two numbers inverted. Now, often when I do that, there's a reason. So I say I'm dyslexic. I'm not actually really dyslexic. But I make mistakes with numbers sometimes that I think is providential. Now, so it's going to be 329 days from October uh, 13th to September 7th. But that 3291 relates to the 2391, the year of the flood. Okay, so I'm just going to write that in here, uh, 2391. And when I do these, these symbols here, that just means an iteration, right? It's just a different arrangement of those numbers. Sometimes it's perfectly a mirror. In this case, it isn't. Okay. Um, so this 3,200 and 91 days relates to the 329 days. So from October 13th to September 7th is 329 days. And that is, we're going from noon, October 13th to noon, September 7th, because that's when those occur at noon. And so it's 329 days. So that 329 days relates to this also relates to the year of the flood, but maybe I'll put this on the other side here. This off this side. I don't see September on the, the chart there. Yes, September is not in this chart. No, it's not. Okay. Right. I'm just saying that this number 329 Right? Yeah. This is 3,291. This is 10 times 329 plus a one at the end. Right? So, yeah. so when we're talking about September 7th, we don't have September 7th on this, this line. Right? But what we do have on this line is, is events. So here, we're going to put uh, we're going to put this here. Um, so 2018, we're going to start on October 13th. So this is the event. The main debt event here in 2018 is October 13th. But this is going to be this 329 days. So it starts on October 13th. It's going to go to September 7th. Because remember, this line, Jotham's line, is relating to messages that are undermining or counteracting Parminder's undermining, however we want to look at it. 
It's a message contrary to Parminder's. So in no way am I thinking that that's the case. Not even considering Parminder as an enemy, even though I knew about what happened in 2012. I don't know that Parminder's, all I'm doing is studying the scriptures and I'm kind of coming to understand certain things. So we have different dates here. In 2014, we have October 22. Now this, this is gonna be the camp meeting uh, that I go to in uh, Arkansas in 2014. And I'm going to present on the 21st and the, or the 20th and the 21st, I'm going to present chronology. But I'm putting October 22. It's the midst of the week. It's the midst of that camp meeting. It's the Wednesday. And I've always marked that date as the significant date in 2014. But we could say, you know, October 20th, October 21st. But I just put October 22 there. And... Okay, so this message here is going to relate to chronology. In 2015, there's going to be a message that's given regarding Islam. So, does anybody know about that history in 2015? So I'm going to do some presentations. Well, wasn't that the year where the I discovered Ezekiel and then uh, 390? Well, that's going to be that's going to be 2016. Okay. Right. So that that's uh, I mean I understood the 390 in 2014. But I didn't have it connected with the with the prophecy of Josiah. That's going to be in 2016 um, that I'm going to understand that. Okay, so these things are it's it's the progression of these messages. So here I'm going to understand the 26th day of the fourth month. That is, I'm going to understand uh, that we can take. Um, July 27th, 1299, and see that it's the 26th day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar. And that, that the 26th day of the fourth month is also July 27th in 1840. Now, I also noticed that the 26th day of the fourth month in 1449 is July 18. But that doesn't mean anything to me in 2015, right? Because I don't have Samuel Snow's letters yet. I don't, I'm not using July 18 as a symbol for 187 yet. But in 2015, I recognize the 26th day of the fourth month. But somebody's talking here. I don't know who is. I can't. I just muted myself. Okay, so. How that came about to understand the 26th day of the fourth month. Um, was that uh, in the camp meeting in Alberta. In the previous year, I had had nine presentations or eight presentations. I can't remember. Maybe it was eight. Eight presentations in 2014 uh, relating to a chronology. 
And in 2015, Tabo gave me three presentations. Um, he didn't seem as interested in uh, me presenting um, as he had in the previous year. Now, I'm not particularly particularly certain why, but he, he gave me three presentations, which I think I did in two days. I, I think it, I, I'm trying to remember how that came about. I'm not not certain where where I, when, when I gave those presentations, which days. I mean, I know, I just can't remember right now. Um, so in, in 2000, and I'm just trying to figure this out here. In 2015, um, I can't find it here quickly. I'm trying to remember what date it was. No, it was in, I believe it was in July. So I, I don't know the exact date right now. I'm going to have to look that up again. I, I think it was um, that the camp meeting started on July 17th, but I'm not sure which days I presented on. So, but anyway, in 2015, we're going to have this symbol. And this symbol is... Uh, the symbol of the 26th day of the fourth month. So I'm just going to put this here. I'll put the date that we have uh, as well, but I just don't have that yet. So we'll put a date in there. But that's the symbol that's understood. Um, so the 26th day of the fourth month is understood in 2015. Um, and then in 2016, that's where we're going to understand the 391. Now, this date here is um, it's uh, July 16th, I believe. If I do the presentation. So July 16th. Uh, 2016, I'm going to understand the 391.5. That is, the relationship there between the prophecy of Josiah and the prophecy of Josiah Lich. Right. So I do that presentation on the Sabbath at the School of the Prophets. Normally, we would speak at the Lambert Church, but because of a storm, and this is a storm that um, uh, caused, um, uh, trying to think who it was, but they were uh, in um, Little Rock, and this storm uh, caused them, I know it was, I believe George Bush or Clinton or something were there, and they had to take shelter. And that storm put out uh, all for weeks some people were out for weeks their power was out and lambert church the power was out it wasn't restored but it was restored at the school of the prophets so we were able to instead of having church at lambert uh, we had the church at the school of the prophets and and because the power had gone out uh, daniel from brazil who was supposed to present that sabbath asked me to present in his stead so i ended up presenting what I had just figured out that week. And um, so, and Stephen was there. Um, and, and this had to do with uh, study with me and Michael as well, things that we are trying to hammer out. So I came to understand the prophecy of Josiah and presented it. So that prophecy of Josiah uh, connecting these, and Jeff saw the significance of it and said a lot of things are gonna come out of the book of Ezekiel. He took uh, the D he made DVDs of this presentation and for the next couple of months handed them out wherever he spoke. So, so Jeff understood the significance to some degree of what was discovered. So that's 2016. Now, this is also the year in which Parminder, Marco, and Tabo are ordained as elders. So there's a lot that happens in this year that's that's not being mentioned. 
But what I'm mentioning here is specifically this presentation, because I think it's the most significant. Now, we, I do do presentations on Ezekiel in the fall camp meeting. So Jeff invites Heidi and I to go back. We go back again in October of 2016. But I'm marking this presentation the Sabbath presentation as the significant date in 2016 with the significant understanding. Now, in this, in that year, Stephen and I came to understand the 1764 uh, years from 34 AD uh, to um, 1798 and going back from 34 AD to uh, uh, 1630. Oh, was it six, no. 1731. 1731, yes. Yeah, thanks. 1731, when uh, Jacob anoints his 12 sons and he dies that year. So, so this become, became really significant. 1764 uh, becomes a symbol. It's seven times 252. And uh, it shows up in other places as well. Um, so, and, and as a longer number, uh, 17640, right? So that is, if you take um, uh, 490 times 360, uh, is it 490 times 360, you get 187640, uh, 17640, right? So, if you take the 70 weeks, it's oh, not, no, it's 176400, right? You get two zeros at the end. 176,400. So you have that symbol in there. So even in the 70 weeks, we can see that that 2520 symbol exists. That is, if you take 2520 times 70, you get the same number of days that you would have in 490 prophetic years, that is years of 360 days. So it ties all of these symbols, all of these symbols, the 70 weeks, the 2520, all of these are tied together, the 252. And this is a way in which we can demonstrate that this 1260 years, which we just sort of take as a separate prophecy, a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, we have this 1260 that's just there, uh, that we don't see its connection to uh, the 70 weeks, right? That is, we don't think about the 70 weeks ending in 34 AD and the 504 years to the beginning of the 1260. Nobody thinks about that, right, in Adventism. We don't have a means to see the significance that there's two times 252 years from the stoning of Stephen to the beginning of the papacy. It's just not ever seen as significant. Nobody thinks about it, right? But that is an important number. So, so anyway, that's understood in 2016. So you can see all of these chronological pieces being put into place. Now, in, in 2014, I have the October 22nd date there, but, but what's shown at that camp meeting is uh, that chronology has this significance as these, you know, so what I present there, I present the 666 years uh, from Ezekiel's prophecy so dealing with Ezekiel's prophecy from wh where he counts, he gives the count of uh, the captivity of Jehoiachin and that Jehoiachin's captivity number, that the destruction of Jerusalem happens in the 666th year of Jehoiachin's captivity. So I present that in 2014. I present these spans of time and their sim symbolism and how they're connected uh, and the chronology of the spirit of prophecy. I get a lot of the early chronology I hadn't sorted out 
um, some of the early chronology yet. I didn't have the correct year for the creation of the world, but I was trying different things. Um, and I, I didn't fully understand um, the year that the Exodus occurred. I had in 1532 um, was the year of the Exodus instead of 1533 BC. I believe that's what I had. So I was doing an ordinal count of the 480 years instead of a cardinal. But anyway, so, so there was things that I was understanding in 2014. In 2015, we have Islam in 2016. We have now the prophecy of Josiah. And in 2017, uh, what's going to be significant in 2017? Sig significant date is going to be September 23rd. Oops. So what's September 23rd in 2017? That was the Revelation 12 sign prophecy. Okay, so the, it's it's a failed prediction, right? Just like December 21st, 2012 is. It's, it's a failed prediction, right? And it's on that date, September 23rd, 2017, that I'm going to present uh, July 18th, okay? Jeff presented the pandemic in that same year, too. Huh? Uh, yes. So lots happens in 2017. So at the beginning of the year, Jeff comes to Alberta, presents Rafi and Paneum. And with Paneum, he presents the idea of pandemonium, which would be the BML riots and things like that, and the pandemic, all of these things that are coming. Now, of course, he doesn't understand that these are in our lines in the way that we understand them now. He just sees that that's Rafi and Paniya, Midnight, Midnight Cry. He doesn't have dates for them. He doesn't have November 9th and July 18th or anything like that. And Jeff, really, in some ways, he's still talking about something that's future from our time. That is, we haven't come to midnight yet. But these things are going to be fulfilled with the pandemic in the year of the pandemic in 2020. So Jeff doesn't know that. Now, um, there's gonna be other things. I'm, I'm gonna understand Ezra and uh, the chiasms in the book of Ezra in, in 2017. I'm gonna actually uh, see Jeff in February. I'm gonna be at Eatonville and I'm gonna present that to him uh, not as, uh, as an official meeting thing, but between some of the meetings, I, I actually show everyone on, on the blackboard um, or whiteboard, whatever it is. I think it was the blackboard, but it could have been a whiteboard. Whiteboard. Anyway, it's a whiteboard uh, that I show this. I show this, um, this chiasm in 457 BC, which really becomes uh, important as I study Samuel Snow's letters. So we're going to have uh, early in the year, Tabo is going to start presenting studies from blessings regarding May 2nd, saying that that's the prediction before midnight. So we're going to hear about the prediction before midnight. Um, but all of these things culminate in the understanding of Samuel Snow's letters. So Tabo knows about the May 2nd letter, but he doesn't know about the July 18 letter or the June 22nd letter, right? He just knows about what happened with the second letter. He knows about the first letter, of course, but he says that the second letter is the prediction before midnight. Now, May 2nd happens to be the center of a chiasm, starting with Snow's first letter, February 16th, to his last letter, July 18th. So I present this at Lambert Church on September 23rd. Now, it is the Revelation 12 sign prophecy, this failed prediction, but I don't know about that at the time. And, and I'm not presenting July 18 as a date that we're going to predict in the future. I'm not saying July 18, 2020. I'm not a time setter, so I'm not talking about future dates. I'm just simply saying that the symbol, the date 
that we have as a symbol of the prediction before midnight is three days before midnight, that publishing of Samuel Snow's last letter before midnight. It's three days before, so midnight, July 21st at Boston. And the reason he's invited, he's invited to speak at Boston, I think to a large degree is because of the publication of this letter. And that's in Boston, he's gonna ride up on the horse, he's gonna have a pretty difficult journey probably from just from sunrise, uh, gets there to Boston and does a short presentation uh, in the morning service on a Sunday at the Boston Tabernacle. And, um, and that is mistakenly placed at Exeter. Okay, now, Daniel here asks, how did you come up with all those four of Samuel's letters? We just looked for them. So we started doing a search on the internet through PDFs of all these Midnight Cry. Um, you wouldn't find them all in uh, on the EG White disc because they don't have all of the articles. So we had to search for them. So it's, I've spent quite a bit of time finding these letters. And I can't remember the order in which I found them. Uh, but I remember finding the June 22nd letter. And um, I didn't find the July 18th letter. I believe that one was found by uh, Tanya. Um, so she noticed the July 18th, I noticed the June 22nd. And um, so we went through all of these Midnight Cry magazines to find these published letters. And then, I'm, then I placed them out on, on a line and notice the biblical dates because I was understanding uh, the biblical dates and how to, to look at them. And so we found that the, the May 2nd letter was published on Passover. Uh, the June 22nd letter is written on Pentecost. Um, so all of these things started to fall together. And, and the first letters published on Passover was first published on the date for the dedication of the temple and then the Passover. It's republished in the signs. So, so all these things are happening in 2017, uh, starting in the spring of 2017 when we start doing this work. So I do presentations at the School of the Prophets in 2017 on the structure of prophetic chronology, um, but it culminates because I'm dealing mostly with uh, Ezra, the book of Ezra, and then it culminates in this um, presentation on September 23rd at Lambert Church. And, and there I clearly present July 18, just not knowing that it's gonna be a date that we're gonna be using in the future. And then 2018, we have the October 13th date. So, <clears throat> so here we have the dates laid out, except 2015, I have to find the date for that. Um, and we have the symbols that are found. Now, um, when Iran puts here in, in the chat, uh, he says, crime seven times seven times seven equals September 23rd. So September 23rd here, he's going, um, uh, the, the number here is, um, let me see if I can figure this out. So can you explain that again, Aran? The prime seven? Yeah, so the prime of 343 is equal to 2309. And okay. that's one way to say it. Yeah, so that is if you take seven times seven times seven. So that's gonna be 343, right? That's a division of the prophetic mirror of 777, right? So if you take the seven weeks at the beginning, at seven times seven, and the seven, seven, the one week at the end, seven years, you multiply that 49 times seven, you get 343. And if you look at the 343rd prime number, it's going to be 2309, that is September 23. So that's, that's what Iran is saying there. Okay. Which is the beginning of 777 seven, seven days. Right, it begins 777 seven, seven days. So we know in this chart here, when we look at September 23rd, 2017, 
that's going to be 777 days prior to November 9th, right? So I could put that in there. Just do it this way. So even though we got we got these 777 days here, we have these 777 days. So, so we know this is all about this chiasm. Okay, so you got the 777 days here. And And we know we're going to have over here, we're going to have 777 days. Um, that's going to go to uh, February 6, 2015. But we're not marking February 6, 2015. We're marking whatever that date is in July. Pretty sure it's in July. Um, now, um, now, in 2014, uh, you know, we have October 22nd there. But I just want to note, um, actually, if we go back to 2013, so 2013, we have December 21st, 2012. We're just using that as a starting point. But we remember that in 2013, uh, Jeff is still going to be doing, at the beginning of the year, his um, Habakkuk's two table study, right? And uh Emiliano is going to go to Jeff's place and he's going to come to see Ezra 7 9 right now on August 31st Jeff is going to ask so I have it here um no, I don't. yeah here it is there's this camp meeting this camp meeting is i don't know do i not have it on this mm -hmm. Yeah, here it is, August 31st, down at the bottom. So this is December 21st, 2012 to February 6, 2015. On August 31st, Jeff is going to ask a question um, at the end of the Alberta camp meeting, which commenced on August 24th. Jeff asked about Ezra 7-9, and August 15th, 1844 was first calculated Right. And it says here, July 16th, 2016 is the presentation I made on Ezekiel. I don't have anything here. Just trying to see if I have the July 17th there. Yeah, 2015, it's July 17th. So I got these two dates here. Okay, so um, if we go back then to these lines right here. <clears throat> So this is going to be that camp meeting starts on July 17, 2015. But I'm just noting that in 2013 we have this August 31st date, and um, so one of the things that ends up happening in in 2013. So we have December 21st, but we also have August 31st. That's when we're first going to understand the midnight cry date as August 15th. It's going to be the first day of the fifth month. So I calculate that on that date on August 31st, 2013. Okay. And then 
um, we have the 2015, it's going to be a camp meeting that starts on July 17th. And I'm going to present on the 26th day of the fourth month. That is, I'm not specifically focusing on that date, but I'm showing that date is July 27th in 1299 and 1840. But also in 1449, I note that it's July 18th but I just don't see the significance of it, right? <clears throat> okay, so here we have all of these dates laid out. And so what we have to do tomorrow is we have to show this from the scriptures. Now, I wanna just note one more thing here. Um, when it comes to Gerizim, because we asked about Gerizim. Now, Gerizim comes, it's, it's the Hebrew number 1630. But it comes from uh, the Hebrew number 1629. So is there any significance in What, what's the significance of 1629? Okay, it's the number that Brother Odilio presented, right? And this number becomes significant. It relates to all kinds of things. Um, so, and we had tied it to November 24th, 2022. It had significance there. Um, Now we know 1629. If you add 360 to it, you get 1989. What are the other things that we can do? I always forget. Haran, what can we do with 1629? We have uh, Stephen knows too. We have 390. You have 1989. Yeah, so if you add 390, you get 1989. Um, you get 2019. If you add 360, you get 1989. All right, okay. Okay. So it relates to um, November 9th, 2019 and November 9th, 1989. There's also uh, 1,629 days from when Ezekiel begins to prophesy until the siege begins. Okay, yeah. So Ezekiel begins prophesying on the fifth day of the fourth month, right? And then you're going to have the siege of Jerusalem begin 1,629 days later. So that's the thing he's predicting. Now, Iran says it relates to the 777 triangle. Uh, can you explain that, Iran? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, I think it's a right triangle that has a hypotenuse of 777 and one of the sides is 252. And then the area is the reverse of 1629. The, the, the area is what, 9261? Yeah, something like that. It may have an, a, a one there as well. Okay. Yeah, so uh, what I did with that was, yeah, it was a 391 he had it to take you to 2020. Yeah, so yeah. And then plus 391 brings me to 2020, yeah. And then he also took away 911. Oops. So nine minus 911 equals July 18th as a symbol, right? Yeah. So the 1629 becomes significant. Now we're just saying here in this context that this is Mount Gerizim. So Mount Gerizim, Gerizim the Hebrew number is 1630, but it comes from this word Garaz. 
right? And garats means to cut off, to be destroyed, right? Which is kind of odd for the Mount of Blessing. But it can refer, of course, to Christ's week, being cut off in the midst of the week, even though it's a different Hebrew word, right? And this word, garatz, yeah, it occurs only once in Psalms 31, 22. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. And so he's on the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. So this is the midst of the week. This is Christ's week. Right? And it, we tied to September 7th. Now, we don't have September 7th specifically in those lines per se. But we have those years. And, and we probably could mark out all those significant dates in those years. Um, but I just was marking out primarily where I presented something related to chronology. But I mean, we could have different dates in those years. It's just in that period of time of seven years, we have that message of chronology being given to this movement that is uh, counteracting, not any purpose on my part, but on God's providence, what Parminder is going to try to do. So it's going to undermine his work it's going to expose his work without this you know if if this message isn't here we have nothing with which to combat parminder's message and parminder's not going to use any of this that's the thing i found remarkable about parminder i just thought why is he not recognizing any of this the only time he recognized it was on October 14th, that week, when I found the 391.5 days, right? So that's, and, and I see that that went to November 9th, um, which we, we can put in there. Um, when, I, when I saw that number of days, he, he, he acknowledged it. He saw it as significant and had me present at the camp meeting. But of course, he had to, in a sense, retract his support because, because Tess did not support it. Right? So Tess didn't accept this 391.5 days as a witness. She didn't accept what happened on October 13th as a fulfillment of prophecy. She didn't accept Daniel from Brazil's 126 days, and she didn't accept um, that this had any way uh, supported what she was doing. So, of course, this wasn't really done openly. They just tacitly ignored it, right? They didn't give specific messages against it that I know of until much later. Okay, so we're done for today. Um, so we'll come back to this tomorrow. Thanks everyone for your participation. And uh, mm -hmm. thanks. Okay, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study and for each person. We ask for your blessing and help us to continue to check these things out for ourselves, to study these things and understand them. May your angels watch over us today and bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.